Good afternoon and welcome to the CT Private Equity Trust PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Peter Brown, Investment Trust Sales. Good afternoon. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, represent um, Columbia Threadneedle. I am part of the Investment Trust Sales team, uh, and Hamish Mayer is with me, who is the lead manager on the CT Private Equity Trust, and he will be running through his presentation, which will cover the last financial year up to December 22. Um, as mentioned, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat room, and we'll come to them towards the end of the presentation, which should be in about 30, 35 minutes. So with that, I'll pass to Hamish, and... Um, all over to you, Hamish. Thanks, Peter. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for joining this presentation. I'm going to update you on uh, the results for our company for uh, 2022 and one or two of the events that have uh, taken place uh, since then. Um, I'm just going to go through these slides and we we'll, should have plenty of time for uh, Q&A afterwards. So, just to summarize, we had a, a good year in uh, 2022. We've just uh, come out with our results earlier this week. Um, the NEV total return for the year was uh, plus 14.8 percent, and uh, you know that that comes after a number of good years already. So we're um, delighted to be able to, be able to sustain our uh, strong performance couple of uh, things of note uh, during the year we had a strong number for realizations 125 million pounds that's slightly down on last year but last year was an exceptional year where there were 161 million of realizations but to some extent there was a catch-up from uh, 2020 where for obvious reasons there wasn't so much going on but um, 125 million is an excellent uh, number uh, we have announced our latest quarterly dividend at 6.79 pence. It'll be paid at the end, uh, at the end of um, April. Uh, we've got a dividend yield of uh, around 6% at the moment. One of the uh, striking things that happened uh, during the year was that we sold our holding in the Italian funeral homes company San Siro and made an excellent return of nearly nine times our money and a 90% IRR. And um, three quarters of that came through in cash. A quarter of it was reinvested back into the New Deal. Co-investments now account for 43% of the portfolio. Uh, it's been fairly constant throughout the year. Our long-term aim is to move towards 50% in co-investments with about the same uh, in funds. So having a balance between co-investments and funds, which we think is uh, optimal in terms of the uh, risk profile of the company with enough concentration on individual companies that if they go well, they can uh, substantially move the needle. If they don't work out, it's not the end of the world. And we get some natural, uh, very extensive diversification through our funds portfolio. Um, there were a couple of new investments made at the tail end of uh, 2022. Uh, and I'll talk more about these uh, in a moment, it was Family First, which is a chain of uh, nursery uh, nurseries in the south of England, and Med Spa, which is a uh, chain of um, essentially um, medical spa, um, uh, is providing aesthetic treatments in uh, Canada. Um, looking at the long-term progression of value, this uh, chart, the dark blue is the NEV, the light blue are the cumulative dividends. You can see we've had uh, pretty good growth in, in recent years. And uh, just to remind everybody, the dividend is calculated um, each quarter, and it's 1% of the average of the last four quarters uh, NAV. And if that uh, calculation leads to a number that is below the previous dividend, we maintain the previous dividend. So it's, a, if you like, an upwards only dividend policy. We've had this in place for over a decade now, and um, the uh, annual dividend growth comes out at 16.2% per annum, uh, which is pretty respectable. And as I mentioned earlier, the next dividend is paid at the end of this month. 
In terms of the um, NAV and share price total return, the share price is the light blue line, the NAV total return, the dark blue one. You can see there's a long term, there's a very close relationship between these, but in the short term, there has been a divergence because the discount has opened out. Um, share price is a bit below where it was when we prepared this presentation, but it um, has uh, it has been recovering. Uh, still a very sort of an obvious anomaly between the, the share price and the NAV growth. And we're hoping that that anomaly can be be uh, rectified in the near future. If we go on to the next page, it's just another way of looking at performance over one, three, and five years and looking at the discrete numbers for each of the individual years. And you can see that um, we've had uh, a good 2022 followed by an excellent 21 and 20. Um, and, uh, you know, good growth before that as well. So, you know, private equity is a, a long-term asset class. You should judge it over the long-term, and the long-term numbers are very, um, are very strong. In terms of outstanding commitments, these are commitments to private equity funds, and people like to monitor this just to make sure that we're not um, getting carried away in terms of uh, committing money that we don't have at, at our disposal, but we are... Um, We've got quite modest outstanding commitments at the moment, 179 million pounds, which is uh, very comfortable compared to our historic range. And um, it is necessary to have uh, a decent amount of outstanding commitments because these commitments are drawn down and the portfolio is refreshed. And if we didn't have outstanding commitments, we'd run a risk of not being able to fully refresh the portfolio from year to year. In terms of debt, we don't have much debt, a small amount of net debt at the year end, and it's gone up slightly since then. Um, we do believe in the benefits of uh, gearing because we expect to make returns from investments that are far in excess of the cost of borrowing, and that therefore enhances the return to shareholders. We also don't believe in running with large piles of cash on the balance sheet because that detracts from the return uh, to shareholders. Um, we have a, a large revolving credit facility. It's about 115 million pounds, uh, roughly, and most of that is available um, should we need it for making new investments. If we have a mismatch between realizations and new investments, then we can use that borrowing facility, and we have done effectively over the years. Uh, this page just runs through the new investments that have been made during 2022. Um, there are uh, lots of different ones, a mixture of fund commitments and uh, co-investments. Um, they are diverse by the um, sectors that they're covering, the geographies and the, the managers that are involved. Um, common factor is that they're largely mid-market buyout funds or, or growth equity funds in the mid-market, mainly in Europe with a small number in North America. Um, and that has continued on. Here we see uh, a number of the, the new ones, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, we've also made some new investments during 2023. Um, there's uh, three new ones here, GT Medical, uh, which basically as a sort of novel form of um, treatment for uh, cancer, uh, Lead Venture, which is a software company in the US, and Axiom, which is a new um, lower mid-market uh, fund, a so-called emerging manager fund, um, where we've identified some very able young people that we're, that we're backing in this new fund. So I've got uh, some slides on some of the more recent uh, co-investments, which I will talk about uh, quickly. There's a bit more detail on these slides that you can consult at your leisure, but um, the first one is uh, Leader 96. So this is an electric uh, bike company. Uh, it's based in Bulgaria and it services markets largely in Western Europe. So um, Germany, France, Spain, the UK. Um, there is quite low penetration of e-bikes as they're called into the UK and in France and Spain. It's far commoner in uh, Germany and the Netherlands, but the trend is well established. And this is a, a good way of 
playing the trend towards people um, using these electric bikes. The deal is led by the Rohatton Group, whom we've invested with a few times over the years, and we aim to make about four times our money over the next four or five years. Next investment is Refine. So Refine is a company that does audits for good manufacturing practice for pharmaceutical companies. Um, this used to be a bit of a cottage industry, the sort of small consultancies, but it's now becoming larger in scale and Refine are growing quite rapidly into a strongly growing market. The market itself is growing because lots of new drugs are coming onto the market and um, the, the companies that make these drugs, they all need to have these GMP audits. And they, uh, the beauty of the refine approach is that when they have an audit done for one client, that data can be used for other clients. So it, um, it makes it the situation a bit more efficient for the, um, for the customers. And, um, you know, therefore it's growing quite strongly. So we're hoping to make a, a good, strong return here. It's not an expensive deal. We've come in at less than eight times money. Uh, eight, eight times um, EBITDA or other, and we'd expect to make uh, probably nearly four times our money over the next four years. Um, another new investment is 123 Dentist. This is a chain of uh, dental practices in Canada. The deal is led by Peloton, who are one of the uh, Canadian mid-market players. And this is a really reasonably straightforward rollout of um, uh, dental practices across Canada. They basically buy them and then aggregate them and they've reaped the benefits of scale from buying synergies and, and that sort of thing. And um, the people that are doing this uh, build up have done a very similar thing already. So there's a relatively low risk from a management point of view. Uh, another new investment is NeuroLens. Now NeuroLens is a deal led by MVM. Now MVM specialize in healthcare oriented investments. And what NeuroLens does is it has a a system which consists of hardware and software, which is used to diagnose and treat something called digital uh, vision syndrome. Uh, so that is basically something you get if you spend a lot of time looking at screens or certainly a, a proportion of the population get it and it's quite painful. It can be debilitating and this allows, uh, allows it to be corrected. This is sold to opticians and optometrists and um, you know, there's a lot of uh, growth potential here. MVM specialize in identifying companies that have got good proven technology, but where the product has not been marketed very well. And this is this falls into that category and, uh, and they improve the business and we should make a good return from this over the next four years or so. Uh, next one is Med Spa. So this is the chain of, of spas uh, in uh, Canada and the US. Basically, uh, people have various treatments that they have um, treatments on their skin and they get Botox and uh, things like that, which is a strong growth market. It's quite a resilient market. And once people start uh, using um, a med spa or going to a med spa, they tend to continue to go. It's something that, um, you know, has proven to be quite resilient right the way through, um, you know, the ups, ups and downs of the economic cycle. And so this is uh, about building out a chain across North America. Um, and it's led by Persistence Capital. That's a Toronto based firm that we've known for a number of years. Um, Family First is the chain of nurseries that I mentioned earlier. It's 96 nurseries, mainly in the south of England, around London and the southeast, some of them in the West Midlands. It's a kind of upmarket nursery. And, um, you know, the demographic um, demographics are very supportive of ongoing growth for this sector and uh, for this uh, company. And uh, August Equity have experience in this area. I mean, they've actually been in this company for about three years already, uh, and then they've brought us into it. So we're very much investing into a known entity here with a known uh, lead manager. Um, there have been quite a lot of realizations, as I mentioned earlier, in 2022. Uh, this is a full list of them. I'm not going to talk about them all individually but you can see that they come from a very wide range of different types of company, different geographies, different uh, private equity houses. 
and the outcomes on the right hand side of this slide are, are very good you know you're getting uh, many times your money in most cases you know almost every case you're making a good profit um, as a rule of thumb if the money multiple is north of about two and a half times and the IRR the internal rate of return is is above 25 for uh, percent or so that's a good outcome so most of these would rank as as good outcomes and it's you know it continues on over the page a lot of these businesses have a kind of technology angle or a healthcare angle and there's no surprise there that's a an area where private equity has um shown an appetite you know both at the mid market scale and at the larger end of the private equity market so these are businesses that have generally got uh, good secular growth They're operating in growing markets and the businesses themselves are well positioned within these strongly growing markets. Um, and that is that trend has continued into 2023. We've had a number of realizations so far. We haven't even finished the first quarter or so finishing today. In terms of drawdowns, the portfolio is being refreshed all the time, so lots of new investments going in. Uh, so we've talked about the co-investment investments already, but there are also others that have been drawn down by the funds. Again, well diversified by sector, uh, geography, and the lead manager. And these, this is really laying the foundations for future growth in NAV. Again, you can see quite a strong technology and healthcare. Um, um, bias, if you like, here. Again, this is where the uh, private equity market is most most interested just now. Um, and that's continued on into uh, 2023 as well. Um, this shows you the pattern of drawdowns and distributions over the long term. Now, when you have uh, lots of distributions, you also tend to have quite a lot of drawdowns. It's reinvesting the same uh, money. Uh, so there's clearly a, a relationship between these uh, two numbers. If you don't have much in the way of um, exits, you're probably not going to have so much in the way of new investments. So, um, you know, there's generally a, a matching. Uh, we try and reinvest the, the proceeds of, of realizations, uh, as I said, to build um, growth in asset value for the future. Uh, looking at our la largest underlying holdings, just say a word or two about some of these. And these are things to sort of watch out for as we go through the year. Uh, Sigma is an electrical uh, components company. Now, th this is a US-based business. It's quite uh, it's doing quite well. We may exit this later this year or potentially early next year, but we're not going to be in it for a lot longer. Uh, and we should make a perfectly good return. The next three investments, Cortrax, Ashted, and TWMA, are all led by Buckthorn, who specialize in the energy markets, energy services markets. Ashted is now actually a listed company, and we're, we're selling down that, and that's made uh, quite a good return, which improves by the day because the, uh, the share price is well above the IPO price. Uh, it went to the AIM market in November 2021. It's, it's, it's basically doubled since then. Uh, Cortrax is um, is doing quite well. It's a play on activity in the uh, oil and gas sector, particularly decommissioning. So there's an element of uh, counter cyclicality about it. And then TWMA uh, also involved in oil and gas, but what it does is cleans up oil rig cuttings, and cleans them, and um, to avoid um, polluting the environment and also to lower the costs of production. Uh, and that has been a bit behind plan. Uh, it was it suffered a bit during uh, COVID, but they've now got some really strong contracts coming through in uh, the UAE. And so we think this investment is going to be fine. Aurora is a, a payments um, company in the US, which is, is going well. It's a fairly new deal, but it's making good progress. Jolly's is a, um, the second largest uh, pet shop chain in Britain, uh, which has also uh, done well in recent years. Some of you probably rushed out and bought a dog for yourselves during uh, COVID. Um, if so, you're, uh, you've got that in common with about half the British population. And um, obviously the pet shops are allowed to stay open all the way through COVID. So uh, this business has done really quite well. 
San Siro is the funeral home company I mentioned that um, we have largely exited, but this is the, the rump uh, position, if you like, which is still quite substantial. And we'd expect to make, you know, probably at least two times our money on this rump um, over the next uh, next few years. ATEC is a small insurance company that's a, a deal led by Kester Capital. Uh, they're trying to sell this at the moment. Um, ATEC provides insurance for caravans and little uh, boats. So it's a niche, um, a niche insurer, which is, has done well. AccuVane is the, the vein visualization company. I've talked about this before. It basically allows doctors and nurses to visualize veins on people's arms and, and, and legs more easily and can put in um, a needle uh, and a line much more effectively. That was held up a bit during COVID because the salesman couldn't actually go into the hospitals and sell the product. That's now recovering quite strongly. And then our tenth largest position is Weird Fish, the clothing company. So this has been a bit of a volatile ride for us in the last couple of years. It did, um, at the beginning of COVID, it looked as though it was in serious trouble. Then it did really well as everybody shifted to online um, purchasing. And then since everybody has come back, uh, to work, etc. There's less e-commerce going on, and e-commerce is actually good for businesses like this. They make higher margins, so profits have been under pressure a bit. We did try and sell this business late, um, well, early last year, uh, but the buyer, after quite a lot of diligence, dropped out, and then trading deteriorated. So we're going to be in this for a bit longer, but I think we will do all right in the end. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the st statistics on our co-investment portfolio, which, as I mentioned, accounts for about 43% of the value of the company. This is our holdings of uh, private companies directly. So these underlying businesses have done well. I mean, they've had, on average, 36% revenue growth during 2022. The size of the companies, you can see there, you know, average revenue about 64, the median about 40. So these are... These are not huge companies, but they're certainly not the corner shop. You know, these are substantial businesses with several tens of millions of pounds of, of uh, revenue. And in terms of um, EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, or in other words, cash flow, uh, the growth there has been very healthy, 22%. And the average uh, EBITDA is about uh, just under 14 million pounds. Median's a bit lower than that, but you can see the the, you know, the size of, of the average company. Obviously, there's been a little bit of margin contraction, as you can see there, but the profits not growing as rapidly as revenue. Why is that? Well, it's to do with all the pressures that we um, read about, uh, you know, the inflation, higher energy prices, higher other input prices, supply chain um, disruption and shortages have led to some um, margin diminution, but you're still getting very healthy growth here, uh, which does very much underpin the overall growth in NAV. In terms of um, the number of underlying holdings, now we, we have actually about nearly 500 underlying holdings in this uh, company. Um, it has actually gone up slightly during the year. We've invested in 118 new deals, you know, either through co-investments or through the funds that we are invested in. There were 60 exits um, and some information on the exits. So the there was an average uplift of 36% above the most recent carrying value for the exits. So three months prior to exit, on average, these businesses were valued at 2.9 times money and they were sold out at four times money. So there's a nice boost there. When we look at the weighted average so um skew you know adjusting for the different size of the companies the uplift is even greater it's about 70 percent uplift uh, which is very punchy um about 14 percent of the companies exited during the year which is quite quite a reasonable number um the uh the uplifts actually compare well with the previous year so the um Uplifts are actually slightly higher in 2021 compared to 2022, which itself was a pretty good year. So the point about this is that you look at our share price, it sits at a big discount 
<clears throat> to asset value and people are thinking well is the asset value correct well on the evidence of the exits it clearly uh is uh you know it, it is a, at the very least a fair valuation you could actually argue that the valuation is is um quite conservative given that when the um assets are sold they are sold at a very significant um, premium to the latest carrying value now that is what you would expect to happen uh, but it certainly doesn't provide any justification for our shares being at a very large discount to NAV. Um, looking at, f you know, who's been buying the companies that we've been selling? Well, 44% went to trade, so that's being sold to other companies in the same sector. 52% went to other private equity firms, so typically larger private equity firms. Uh, hardly any uh, went to the stock market. Um, that thing that represents one company actually, and one percent uh, or two percent, one company was bought by its own management. Now that split between trade, sale, and private equity sponsor is a, is roughly constant. That's that's what we would expect, roughly half and half. Um, IPOs are a rare route for exits, and they were even rarer in 2022 than they they usually are. Uh, 21, there was quite a lot of IPOs, but um, you know, I think the most, the busiest quarter, it might have accounted for some of like 16% of exits. Um, the, typically, it would be well below 10%. Uh, so it's not a major exit route for our portfolio. And you know, where were the exits achieved? Well, the largest individual component reflects the largest portion of the portfolio, and it was in the UK. Italy is obviously strongly represented here because of the San Siro exit, and the Netherlands was actually the Stax exit, which was the um, clean room consumables that we sold earlier in the year. Um, so, you know, pretty healthy environment uh, for exits uh, during uh, 2022. Uh, in terms of the geography, we're 42% in the UK. Most of the rest is in continental Europe. Uh, there's about 17% in the States. That's the largest private equity market in the world. Uh, so you'd expect that. Um, and in terms of vintage, uh, about 60% is more than three years old, 50% more than four years old. Uh, why do I mention that? Well, we're typically looking at a four-year hold for an investment. So as they come into the three to four-year um, age bracket, these are these deals are maturing. And so uh, it's from that maturing element that you will get realizations. And realizations, as we've discussed, um, tends to drive uh, NAV growth. And so we will always have a steady flow of realizations because we've always got an element of the portfolio that is maturing. In terms of the valuation, it's actually gone down slightly and EV to EBITDA ratio of 11.6 times, it's slightly down from last year. Uh, and that compares with an entry uh, price of about 8.7. Uh, you know, typically we're in the eights, you know, it's eight point something, uh, which is pretty good value for mid-market uh, high growth companies. And in terms of uh, the underlying indebtedness of these companies, that is, is not high at all. It's 3.1 times on a debt to EBITDA, which is uh, very similar to what it was last year. Uh, so these businesses are, in general, not very highly geared. In terms of sectors, we've got the breakdown here. The two large sectors are information technology and healthcare, which between them account for nearly half the portfolio. And, um, you know, I've mentioned this already. There's some good secular growth characteristics in both these um, these sectors, you know, the software and services, a lot of this is to do with the digitalization of the economy, which is, was accelerated during the, the pandemic. And then in healthcare, you know, the demographic arguments and uh, are, are, you know, well known to most people. There are also some significant technological ad advances, which mean that this sector is generally growing faster than the economy as a whole. And there's some very innovative companies involved in the different tiers of the healthcare sector and uh, you know we're exposed to quite a few of them business services is also quite significant um, uh, consumer discretionary is not a large sector for us but we are involved in it um, you know it's a large part of the economies that we invest in so if that's uh, it would be natural that we'd have some exposure there 
So basically, just to conclude and give a few comments on the outlook, the portfolio has done very well. It's proved to be resilient right the way through the pandemic and out the other side. It's also proved to be resilient um, under the current um, sort of macroeconomic uh, challenges. Uh, interest rates have gone up, um, inflation's gone up, but we've still continued to make um, uh, good returns. And uh, we've still got plenty of firepower for new investments. Obviously, we'll reinvest the money that comes back from the exits, but we've also got uh, a large revolving credit facility that's available as well. We are finding plenty of new investments in terms of co-investments and funds. Uh, we have no shortage of opportunities to invest. And if anything, pricing is improving. Uh, we can find good value in the lower mid-market. Um, as I mentioned, exits have held up extremely well, good premium to uh, previous uh, carrying value, which um, you know suggests our, our valuations are very sound. And um, you know the underlying portfolio, as I mentioned, has, has grown well in terms of revenue and uh, profits. Uh, there's plenty of appetite for uh, private equity globally. Um, you know, that is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. There's lots of people who have increased their allocations in recent years, and they're not going to reverse uh, reverse that in any sort of meaningful way. The commitments are out there. They will be gradually drawn down. They'll go into the market. Um, you know, they will vary the rate of deployment of capital depending on how they're feeling and how, uh, you know, risky they think things are. But uh, the longer term picture is that that money will be, be deployed. Um, and as I mentioned, information technology and healthcare is a significant area for us and a good driver of long-term growth. So as we uh, just finished the first quarter of uh, 2023, we uh, are, are confident that we will uh, continue to build value for shareholders over the medium and longer term. And we'll have a better idea of that as we progress further into the year. Uh, so I think I would now uh, like we're going to some questions. So Hamish, thank you very much indeed for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated in the right hand corner of the screen. But just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted already today, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your Vesta dashboard. Um, as you can see, we have received uh, a number of questions throughout today's presentation. Thank you to everyone for submitting those. Peter, can I just ask you to read those questions out where appropriate to do so for Hamish to give his response? Yes, sure. Um, thank you, Hamish, for that uh, update. We've had a few questions. Um, we'll start with the, the first and probably the most common, which is uh, obviously very important for shareholders, and that is basically the share price or, in fact, the discount to the net asset value. Um, there's been a few questions. I'll come to them in a minute. I mean, I think what what, what is great is that the near 15% gain in the NAV is slightly... Um, different to most other asset classes. And we've seen the share price drop over the last six to nine months to the discount. Uh, but the questions specifically are, um, is there any action to try and reduce that discount? Is there um, any way that we can uh, reduce the discount close to NAV, either through buybacks or any thoughts you've got to try and narrow that discount? Um, and basically, I think just a side point, it might be the fact that the market is valuing the shares on the back of, uh, or not having um, confidence in the valuations in not just this portfolio, but other portfolios that are trading on big discounts. Can you run through a, a little bit about the yeah. valuation control yeah. and, and that kind of thing, basically? Absolutely. I mean, obviously, the shares trading at a significant discount to NAV, you know, it's 30 something percent at the moment, um, is, uh, is frustrating for me as is for all of you. Um, I mean, essentially what uh, happens in the stock market is that when they go into a sort of risk off mode, they tend to sell shares in uh, private equity investment trusts rather indiscriminately. And, um, you know, our discount is slightly narrower than our direct peers, but it's still um, still sort of unacceptably large in, in my view. Uh, the converse is also true that when the market is feeling uh, more optimistic and it goes into a sort of risk on mode, you will tend to see those discounts narrow very significantly. And that can happen quite quickly. And, you know, at some point uh, during the year, that is highly likely to happen when people start seeing through 
you know, the current sort of challenges in the macroeconomic situation and look out uh, the other side and they can see, um, you know, plenty of growth and they start to sort of realize, well, actually, this portfolio has been growing strongly uh, in NAV and it's delivering strong growth in uh, dividends. So that's real money that's being handed uh, back. Um, you know, the, the only sort of long term solution for uh, discounts is for for me to find more buyers of the uh, of the shares and sellers. So most of our uh, shareholders are wealth managers. Um, you know, we have got some pension funds and other institutions, but uh, a lot of them are wealth managers. And there's also the platforms and there's our savings plan. And uh, we think this is an excellent long term investment. So we're constantly trying to convince people to to buy the shares. I mean, at the moment, when you're on a very big uh, discount, I mean, it is a great opportunity. Now, uh, people will ask about discount control mechanisms. So when the discount is this wide, uh, you know, there is a limit to what can be done directly there. We have done buybacks in the past. We do that very sparingly because although that does provide a bit of an enhancement to NAV, um, it does shrink the size of the company. And if you were to do too much of that, you basically make the investment itself uh, riskier uh, than it was because you still got substantial outstanding commitments. So if you do buybacks, you shrink the NAV, uh, but you've still got the commitments. Yes, you will enhance the NAV per share uh, a little bit. To make a big difference, you'd have to buy back quite a lot. Um, and once that money has gone, that's it, it's gone. You can't use it for investment. So we always have to balance the potential use of money for buybacks against what we can do with that money uh, in new investments. And when you buy a new investment, you might be targeting sort of 25, 30, 35% per annum return. That is not just a one-off once return. That's a return every year for probably four or five years. Whereas if you buy back the shares, your, your enhancement is instantaneous, but that's it. It's only once. It doesn't compound itself uh, year after year. Uh, so um, that doesn't mean we're never going to do buybacks, but it does mean that there is quite a high uh, sort of threshold before we would actively uh, consider that. And, um, you know, we are constantly getting advice from our uh, stockbrokers about what is and isn't a good time to be contemplating buybacks. But when they recommend to us that by sort of clearing a loose line of stock, we would significantly improve the share price, then we will do that. But that, that is quite a rare situation. Um, so I think, you know, the best policy is really to uh, tell everybody about the shares, point out the, the value, explain to them what's going on in the underlying portfolios, uh, and the dynamics of that portfolio. And, um, you know, we should see the shares going better. I mean, since the results came out a couple of days ago, the, the price has improved uh, significantly, and I expect it to continue to improve from here. Okay, that's uh, that's fine. Thank you very much for that uh, insight. Um, on a slightly different tack, someone's asked a little bit more detail on weird fish and Acuvain. I know you mentioned it briefly in your presentation, but could you give another minute on each? Yeah, your thoughts? yeah. So Acuvain um, has this um, this equipment that, uh, as I mentioned, it helps people um, identify sort of veins and arteries. It uses an in infrared technology to shine on the on the patient's arm or leg. Um, it's sold largely in the US. It's sold into um, hospitals. You have to convince the, uh, the clinical people to use it. Now, uh, when the salesman can demonstrate it to, to those clinical people, they tend to, they tend to buy. Uh, they were held uh, back significantly during COVID because for months on end, they weren't allowed to go into the hospitals and demonstrate their equipment. So there's an element of catch up now taking place. Uh, so, you know, that that um, that investment should be fine. It's led by MVM, whom I mentioned earlier. They specialize in investing into companies which have got uh, technology or products that work, but where it requires a bit more sort of commercial input to maximize the potential of those products and hence the profits of the business. And that's exactly what they're doing. So, you know, that will be fine. Um, Weird Fish has been a bit like the sort of grand old Duke of York, you know, goes up to the top of the hill and comes down again. Um, 
the people that run it uh, are very experienced, um, you know, clothing industry executives. They're very much incentivized to do a good job for us. And they have been buffeted around by the, um, you know, the volatile environment we've had for the last few years. Um, but they will recover again. Um, in a way, their e-commerce offering went from being relatively unsophisticated at the beginning of COVID to being really quite slick a few months later and drove profits. Uh, that has decreased in significance, but the actual um, efficient system they have got is still there. Um, obviously, anything that's consumer related at the moment in the UK has been under pressure. Um, you just need to walk along your local high street uh, to see that. Um, but, you know, that should recover later in the year. Um, so, you know, we're still making good money on this on this deal. It's just a question of how much we're going to make when we eventually exit it. The exit is probably realistically another couple of years out. It might be quicker than that. We nearly sold it at the beginning of last year. There was a very large, well-known um, uh, clothing chain that was about to buy it. And what happened there was that there was a change in management in that company and they dropped the idea of doing the acquisition. And that's quite understandable. A new person comes in, they're not necessarily going to follow through with a sort of three quarters executed plan of the previous management. So that was, I think we were probably a bit unlucky on that on that side. And then since then, the, the business has, uh, has softened off a bit, um, or, well, quite a bit, actually. But I think we will be okay on this one in the long term. Okay, thank you for that. Um, moving on to co-investments that you've got in the portfolio. Um, how precise are the expected return figures and how often are they, uh, how do they vary in, in, in the future when they actually come about? Yeah, well, I mean, the interesting thing about investment management, including private equity investment management, is it's all about predicting the future. And, uh, you know, that is a kind of uncertain business. Um, you know, if it was easy, uh, you know, I wouldn't still be doing this. Um, so the, the the numbers we have in the presentation, these are our target returns, if you like. These are the sort of uh, base case returns. And um, it doesn't always work out like that, uh, which I don't think you'll be surprised to hear. But most of the time it does work out at or close to those numbers. Uh, I always think if you're an investment manager, if you're if you're right or broadly right, 65% of the time you're probably going to be in a very good position, and and we probably do we probably have that kind of a hit rate probably better than that. Occasionally things will go badly wrong, and you'll lose everything, but that is rare. I mean that does happen. Uh, it has happened to me a few times in the last sort of 30 years. Um, and I think any seasoned private equity investor would admit that they have lost money or, in fact, lost everything on some investments. And if they say they haven't, it probably means that they're, you know, they haven't had much experience or they're probably being a bit economical with the truth. Uh, so most of the time we get it right. Um, and if we can do 25% net IRR for a co-investment, you know, two and a half times plus, uh, we will be doing uh, fine. Our long-term track record for our co-investments, we've done over, in this portfolio, we've done over 80 since 2003. Our long-term return, I think, is about 2.3 times money uh, with an IRR, I think, about 23%. It's actually in our results uh, statement, uh, which is only just below our target of 25%. So I think we can probably say that we do uh, hit our target or get very close to it. Lovely. Um, with regards to realizations, you mentioned it in the, in the presentation, um, and many of the realizations are to other private equity firms. The question comes, Are is there a vested interest in maintaining valuations at these levels Then the valuations may not be supported by public markets or more broadly why do you think that there's very few that go to an ipo rather than a, a, a resale yeah i mean most of them don't go to ipo because they um you know they're probably not big enough at the point of exit i mean the the um 
the viable minimum size for a new issue, as we used to call them, is now, you know, it's in the sort of hundreds of, of, of millions rather than, you know, 50 million or 80 million, which it used to be. And so uh, a lot of our businesses aren't actually that big when they're when they're sold, uh, when, they, when they actually exit. Um, secondly, private equity has, in the last couple of decades, has, if you like, um, filled um, the space that used to be occupied by the junior sections of the stock market. You know, some of you will remember the USM and obviously AIM exists, but it's not quite as uh, comprehensive as the main list. Uh, and then there's the smaller end of the um, of the, the the official list or the main list, as, as they call it. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of um, companies would go public and then they would discover that there was no liquidity in their shares and they were not able to to use the public markets to raise capital. They'd struggled to do rights issues or to or placings, and yet they would have all the disadvantages of being a public company. And also, management would find it harder to make money. Uh, you know, they they would not typically have a large uh, proportion of the shares, and so a lot of people who would other in a in another age have been running public companies are now running private equity backed. Uh, companies. So the companies are staying private for longer. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that IPOs are, are uh, you know, a very small proportion of our exits. Um, uh, what was the first part of the question, Peter? Uh, well, uh, you've answered it basically. It was about, um, well, we, we'll move on to the next question, but it's basically about valuations in, in public markets. Is there a, do we have a vested in, does private equity have a vested interest? In yes. That, that. Keeping the uh, valuations up, you know, as though it's a sort of pass the parcel exercise. Well, um, the larger private equity funds have got people who are backing these funds in order to make uh, returns. You know, they have to make absolute returns. It's not a relative game at all. Um, you know the the people that are buying these uh, companies, they, they you know they won't get their carried interest if they don't make uh, adequate returns. So they're very hard-headed people. I mean, they will not actually buy companies unless they're sure they can make a return. So just because it's sold from one private, smaller private equity firm to a larger private equity firm doesn't imply that you know somebody is overpaying. You might as well say that if you had shares in BP and you sell them to somebody else that the next person has got no chance of making money. Well, you know, BP or any large um, public company, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, whatever, they have been growing probably for 100 years and continue to grow. So it's just about, um, you know, people, uh, you know, doing part of the journey, if you like, and then somebody else taking the, the later part of the journey and then and the business continue to grow. Um, also, different um, different investors have different required rates of return. Different um, private equity houses will put in different capital structures. You know, some of them will have more debt, some will have smaller amounts of debt. That has a direct bearing on the returns that they can make. So, you know, just because you're selling it to another private equity firm doesn't mean that um, you know that they can't make money. I mean, they, they can probably also make money. I mean, they may overpay for it. From our point of view, if we're selling and somebody overpays for it, well, that's, you know, that's their 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 problem, really, rather than ours. Um, but as I say, you know, people, they don't deal on a whim. They, they deal after months and months of scrutiny and work. So they, you know, they, they, they tend to, um, you know, have a very solid basis for the, the price that they're paying. Okay, lovely. Um, and moving on, uh, but still on the same vein of valuations, um, how do you reconcile the EV, EBIT uh, or the PE multiple compression witnessed in the UK listed small company space mm -hmm. where we're seeing some NAVs and uh, of the open-ended funds and some share prices down 20 to 40% yeah. with the NAV performance of the trust? In other words, the, the holdings you've got seem to have held up, whereas the others yeah. seem to be compressed a bit. Yeah, because our portfolio isn't a sort of proxy for the the you know the small cap index. Uh, it you know it doesn't have the same sort of um, it doesn't have the same uh, sectoral balance. Um, you've got to bear in mind that private equity companies are by definition a small subset of 
all the available companies, including the public companies that are out there. Um, and so, you know, they are not, you know, they're not uninfluenced by what's going on in the stock market and the wider economy, but they're not, um, you know, they're not a sort of proxy for it. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you, there's a temptation for people to read across from small cap listed companies to private equity and try and come up with, um, you know, complicated models that will try and identify value. Um, I think that's um, a pretty inexact science. So inexact, it's almost not worth doing. Um, so uh, the other thing is that a lot of these uh, uh, smaller listed companies, their prices ran up far, far higher than anything that happened in, uh, in private equity. And therefore, when the correction came, they probably came rattling down. I mean, the public markets, as I'm sure most of you are aware, have a tendency to sort of overbuy things and then oversell things. Private equity, because it's um, you know it's valued every quarter, tends to have um, you know smaller amplitude waves, if you like. Uh, so um, you know, I think I think if you look at the EV to EBITDA multiples of private equity portfolios like ours and compare them with the uh, public markets, you'll find they're actually pretty competitive. Most of the time, they're lower, actually. So, you know, it's another illustration of the value that is there. Do you know the average EBITDA of the portfolio and revenue growth on top of your head? For the public companies, I don't actually. Otherwise, I'd probably just mentioned it. Okay. But uh, for these companies, it's obviously, uh, you know, it's a lot of point or something. Um, the current uh, valuation and uh, EBITDA growth is, you know, is last year at 22%, which I think will compare well with the growth. I mean, you've got to be careful because you know you can't compare EBITDA growth directly with some earnings growth. They are two different things that are connected, but they're not exactly the same thing. Um, and you know, you've got to make sure that you are comparing, you know, apples with apples rather than apples and oranges. Sure. And I think we'll we'll finish um We'll answer all questions uh, after the um, presentation. So we will get to round to you if I haven't mentioned one of your questions. But we'll finish on um, the fact that uh, 2023, uh, we've probably seen some realisation volumes reduced because of the volatility we've seen in markets. Um, is that true? And uh, do you have much visibility for the rest of the year? Was it too early to tell? Yeah, so uh, things are still being sold. Um, so, you know, certainly things have not fallen off a cliff or anything like that. Um, it's, um, you know, visibility, it's difficult at this stage in the year to have a lot of visibility. I mean, uh, last year, as I said, we did 125 million of exits. Um, you know, if we did 100 million this year, I think that would be a pretty good outcome. Um, it's too early to tell um, whether that would happen. Um, in 2020, when we had a very depressed year we still had about 40 million or 39 million of of exits so that would be a sort of lower very much a lower uh, bounding uh, uh figure so you know 100 million would be it would be a good outcome for this year it could be better than that um you know throughout most of 2022 i didn't expect we'd get up to anything like 125 million um uh, Notwithstanding the fact that I knew that San Siro was likely to exit for, you know, about half the year, so um, you know, I tend to be, I tend to err on the side of caution when I'm talking about numbers here. So hopefully, we'll get a decent number for um, 2023. That's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for covering off so many questions today. As Peter said, we'll we'll pick up on uh, any of those other questions, and we're appropriate to do so. The team will publish responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. Hey, Mr. Just before we redirect investors to provide you their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and Peter, um, can I just ask you just for a few final closing comments, please? Yeah, well, thanks very much, everybody, for uh, listening this afternoon. Um, you know, our, our company has been going now for, you know, 24 years. We've delivered excellent growth over that time period. If you, if you compare progress in this company with uh, what could have been achieved in the stock market. We've um, delivered an annualized return that's approximately double the annualized return that you would get in the stock market. We've um, had capital gains that are three or four times the amount that you would have achieved uh, in the stock market. That's because private equity does carry higher risk, but if it's done properly, you are paid for that risk and you will get a premium return. 
And I think the results that we've just delivered, uh, in addition to those we've done in previous years, do actually prove that if you take that moderate risk um, with us, then you will be rewarded. So thanks very much indeed for your support. Uh, we will continue to manage the company to try and uh, grow the NAV further this year and for many years to come. Thank you. That's fantastic. Hamish Peter, thanks indeed for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close the session? You should be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I know it's greatly valued by the team. On behalf of the management team of CT Private Equity Trust PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session. Thank you and good afternoon.